This week's Torah reading is Haye Sara, A Life of Sarah, which could be subtitled, Three Deaths and a Wedding. <laughs> Chapter 23 begins by announcing that Sarah lived 127 years and is now dead. She died in a city in Canaan that came to be known as Hebron, a name by which it still goes. Since the preceding chapter deals with the incident of the binding of Isaac, the rabbis speculate that Sarah's life was, sh was shortened by the trauma incurred by the knowledge that she nearly lost her only son, whom she had very late in life. In any case, Avraham warns her, then sets out some burial site for the same man that God had promised him, but which he didn't get home. He himself an outsider. In the presence of the local leaders of the people, the sons of Heth, he asks to obtain a grave site. After some back and forth and some bowing and deference on, on Avraham's part, the locals at first seem to be generously offering a site for free, but end up actually charging an exorbitant fee of 400 silver shekels for the field and the cave of Machpelah. Avraham paid it anyway because it was his desired choice for a burial site. To put this in context, 400 sh shekels is said to be about 10 times the early wage of the average worker. This is the first step of, of faith in, Ab in Abraham's acquiring the land Adonai had promised him. Since Machpelah is in Hebron, the point is that Abraham well and truly owned the land that is now considered part of the West Bank. That brings us to chapter 24, when Abraham decides it's time his son Isaac had a wife. He makes his oldest, most trusted servant, Eliezer, swear an oath to get a bride for Isaac among, from among Abraham's relatives rather than from the local people. Some interesting points come up here. Avraham is obviously looking for the second part of Adonai's promise to him. The, point, the promise that he will be the father of multitudes, which couldn't happen unless he ensured he had grandchildren and great children, great grandchildren and so on and so forth. But Avraham went beyond that and wanted to ensure a spiritual legacy as well. So he wanted Isaac to marry someone with his spiritual values, someone within the faith. At that time, he believed God would fulfill his promise to the land. So he does not want Isaac to go back to the land of his relatives. He wants the prospective bride instead to come to Isaac. In our society today, we may think, well, that's odd. Why couldn't Isaac find a wife for himself? The answer is, as always, tradition. Eliezer takes 10 of Abraham's camels and all the best of his master's things and goes on his mission. The chapter is very long, 67 verses and it reveals the spirituality of the servant through the way he goes about obtaining a wife. First he prays when he arrives at the city well that God would, be, would show chesed to Avraham by making something happen. His strategy in taking the ten camel seems, to, seems in part to attract a girl with certain characteristics, considerate, helpful, hospitable, and so on. He prays that the girl who offers water, not only th that the girl will offer water, not only to him when asked, but also to his camels without being asked would be God's sign that she was the one. Practically, before he has finished, Rebecca, who is Isaac's second cousin and Abraham's great niece, comes along and acts exactly according to the prayer. Moreover, she is very beautiful and marriageable age, and generally very suitable in every way. His next step is to give her a nose ring and two bracelets that obviously indicate wealth. The Torah portion gives a lot of details about certain things, such as the weight of the jewelry and the ages of the main characters at various times in their lives. The servant asks Rebecca who her family is and for, a and for a place for himself and his camels to stay. She is instantly welcoming and the servant is ecstatic when he realizes Adonai has guided him directly to Abraham's family. In verse 29 we meet Laban, Rebecca's brother. Laban's name spelled backwards is Nabal, which means fool. And we see further on in Genesis that he is not what you would call a savory person. Laban's interest is piqued. As soon as he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's hands, he said, Come in, blessed of Adonai. Why are you standing outside when I've, when I've tidied up the house and there is room for the camels? Laban actually runs out to meet the man and welcomes him. However, before the servant partakes of all his hospitality, he wants to deal with business. He tells his story in this order. First, I am Avraham's servant. Second, Abraham has been blessed by God and is very wealthy, and he has sheep, cattle, silver, gold, male and female servants, camels and donkeys, etc. Third, Abraham's only son of his old age, Isaac, will inherit everything. And last, if a prospective bride is not prepared to go back to Canaan with the servant, then the deal is off and all the wealth will be lost. 
Then the servant gives a recount in detail of how he came to the city well, what he prayed and what happened with when Rebecca showed up. This amount of detail seems strange given what we, that we know a lot about what happened to Abraham's servant through, um, through what he did, but not specifically his name. He's referred to either as servant or the man. It is logically assumed that it would be Eliezer or Damascus, Abraham's servant mentioned back in Genesis 15 too. There are various speculative theories as to, why the repeti as to why the repetition, but I think it says a lot about the faith that runs through the narrative. Abraham's faith, um, Abraham's faith through his choice of Eliezer and the servant's faith that he has seen modeled by Abraham, and now we are about to see Rebecca's faith. After the servant guides his tale, the family readily consents to Rebecca as a bride for Isaac. The servant gives out more wealthy gifts to the family, and then tried to delay the departure a few days, or, as it, or 10 as it turns out. Some rabbis think 10 refers to 10 months. However, the servant wants to be on his way, and after seeking Rebecca's consent, they leave. In all of this, there is no record in Torah that Rebecca asked about what Isaac looked like. She is prepared to marry him sight unseen, which is pretty out of the ordinary. When they arrive back at Haran, Haran Isaac lifts his eyes up and sees the caravan. In turn, Rebecca lifts her eyes up and sees a young man strolling in the field at dusk, whereupon she, feel, she falls off her camel. <laughs> when she finds out that he is in fact Isaac, she covers her face with a veil. One can speculate that having no real idea of how Isaac looked, he expected her, uh, she expected her expectations, so she fell off her camel in amazement. In any case, they were very happy with one another, and Isaac takes her as his wife and is comforted after his mother's death. In chapter 25, Avraham takes on another wife, Keturah, and he has several sons through her. However, as far as he is concerned, he is the only, er, as far as he's concerned, his only heir is Isaac, to whom he gives everything. Avraham dies at 175 and is buried by, uh, and is buried by Isaac and Ishmael in the cove of, in the cave of Machpelah next to Sarah. The mention of Ishmael hints at the fact that Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael did keep some kind of contact with one another. Chai Sarah ends with the listing of the genealogies of Ishmael, who then dies at 137 years. And we are left with the sense of continuity as Isaac and Rebecca represent the next generation. I'm chanting from Genesis chapter 25, 7 through 10, where it says, now these are the days of the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. So Abraham breathed his lust and died at a good old age, old and satisfied. Then he was gathered to his peoples. Then Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelech in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, next to Mamre, the field that Abraham, that Abraham is buried along with Sarah, his wife. All throughout this entire portion, I felt the notion of family and being unified with family, something that was very heavily emphasized. Abraham buried his wife and was eventually buried alongside her. Eliezer chose a wife for Isaac from among Abraham's family, without, being, without that being the intention. In doing so, God's promise to Abraham was being fulfilled, with Isaac and Rebekah being the beginning of that promise. We even get an honorable mention of Ishmael being in the picture somewhere. All of these things really spoke to me about the importance of having family and sticking with family. The Lord orchestrated it that Abraham would have a lot of family and be able to bury his family, dying from age, not from some other tragedy. The Lord said Abraham was old and satisfied when he eventually died at the young, at the young age of 175. In, in reading the section I chose to chant, I really grasped onto God's desire to see families united spiritually and physically under him, and how it seems to be one of God's recipes for a long and fulfilled life. And in my own life, I know so many families where that isn't the case, and it's very hard on families and individuals. And it was encouraging to me to, in a sense, to see that broken families and broken homes is not the Lord's desire for us. 